Hi guys and welcome back to my channel. Um, you probably are realizing if you watch my week 23 and 24 pregnancy vlog that you're like she's in the same place wearing the same outfit as that video. It's probably it's because I am filming the video on the same day. I didn't want to wait another day to film this because I've been trying to film this video for two days and it's just not coming out how I wanted it to. Um, it's a very hard video for me to film because I feel like there's so much in my heart that I want to share with you guys and so much that happened in my journey to get pregnant with Reeves that I just, I don't want it to be so drawn out and long. I feel like so much has happened. Um, so there's probably going to be a lot that I don't go over that you guys may want me to. I know that I do get messaged on Instagram a lot about my journey of getting pregnant and how I dealt with endometriosis and PCOS and getting pregnant and things like that. So I know that's something that a lot of people are um, interested in knowing. So I'll try to give you a basic run around. Um, my full on trying to conceive with Reeves with Ray um, was a total of 15 months. Um, those of you know that watched my last video, I mentioned that I was previously married. Um, we tried to get pregnant, it never worked out. Um, we tried to, you know, we're thinking about pursuing adoption um, and foster care, but our marriage was just not in the right place and um, my ex just went along with the whole adoption idea but at the end of the day, it's something that he never wanted. So I think he was fine with not having children if he couldn't have them on his own and never really voiced that to me until much later after we were through the process of our foster care license and getting our first foster care child at one point. So that in itself was something completely different, but I wanted to let you guys know that I did try to conceive prior to you know meeting Ray um, years prior to meeting Ray, um, it just didn't work out, and of course I'm very thankful for it didn't because I, you know, got am now with the right person for me, and get to share this journey with somebody who, um, and not only that I treasure, but who treasures me, and going through this for the first time with somebody is just truly amazing, and I, 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 I'm so blessed, you guys. I just cherish every single day. Um, so back on on track here. So 15 months total, and within that 15 months, I had taken about four to five rounds of Clomid, and I worked myself, uh, We worked. my doctor worked me up to 150 milligrams, and I was having um, zero success with ovulating. Um, I was tracking ovulation prior to starting Clomid. It just seemed like the my test line was getting close to positive and I was also using just the cheapy um, ovulation tests strips and also I was getting the digital test as well as I had the little um, I forget it's like a I forget the name of it but I think it's called like I, I'm thinking Ovia but I have the Ovia app but it's this little device that it tests your, your um, you use part of, during the part of the month you're testing, uh, you're putting a little sensor on your tongue so it's testing your hormones through your saliva and then another part of the month you're using um, something that, another little sensor that goes inside your vagina and it's testing your cervical mucus and your hormones and tracking your ovulation. So I was not ovulating you guys I would like show that it would like my body almost try to gear up to ovulate but it just didn't ovulate I never would get a positive on any form that I was using so this little device that I had um, the uh, ovulation test strip and digital test strips weren't giving me positive so then my doctor put me in Clomid and so, you know, month after month was just increasing my, my, um, my doses and still was not getting anywhere. It still seemed like my body would try to ovulate. So, and at this time I was just sticking with my general gynecologist that was giving me the Clomid. 
So I could have probably went to my to an, a specialist, a fertility specialist, and had possibly a trigger shot to make my ovaries um, release those follicles to ovulate um, and do like IOI or so, something like that. But we weren't quite there yet. We're trying to just take baby steps here in this in the journey. And then during this time, my I started getting my period started getting increasingly worse and pain and just something was up. Like you know, it's not normal for every month you get your period to go to the emergency room because you're in so much pain that you're passing out, throwing up, and having diarrhea because your body's just reacting really oddly. So my doctor then decided again. My general gynecologist decided that we should probably do an exploratory surgery, which is a laparoscopy surgery. And see what's going on because I have a strong family history of endometriosis. Starting with my grandmother, my mom's mom, this is my mom's side I'm talking about, had endometriosis and her 30s had a complete hysterectomy but she had had three children so she had no issues getting pregnant. Then my mom suffered with a lot of reproductive issues and hormonal issues starting at a very young age in high school and um, was told that she would never have children, most likely never have children, yet she got pregnant with me at 19. Um, but by the age of 29, she had well advanced endometriosis, like almost to a stage five. Um, if you're not familiar with endometriosis, I think it's kind of old school now, but there are stages one, two, three, four, and five of endometriosis. Um, the amount of endometriosis you have doesn't uh, classify you into the stage that you are you are in um, it's how bad your lesions are how deep those lesions are that put you in that stage so that's at least what one specialist told me I'm not too sure if that's 100% accurate but that's what I was told by a medical professional so I'm just kind of going she had multiple surgeons um, come in her surgery she had a lot of issues with endometriosis on attached to her kidneys and her bladder so long and behold, my mom had a very rough recovery and just dealing with her body just hormonally afterwards that it was just, it was just a mess. But thankfully, she didn't have to suffer with pain. Um, some women who get a hysterectomy still are in pain from endometriosis for the rest of their lives. Thankfully, my mom, that was not the case for my mom. My mom would have loved to have more children, but it just didn't work out for her. She never got pregnant besides me. So... I just, you know, I guess that was just her fate. Um, now my mom's sister, my aunt, also has endometriosis. It's very mild. She had her gallbladder taken out and so she had a laparoscopy then and the doctor did see some endometriosis growth in her abdomen. However, it said it was mild and that she doesn't really have to do anything about it at this point. But she has three children and has not suffered... Um, she did not suffer to get pre like with infertility to get pregnant with them. However, later on, after she had her third child, she's had two miscarriages. She's not she has not been able to carry a pregnancy since her third child, um, and she is young. She is um, thirty six years old. So I still think that's young, but maybe this might be old in the fertility world. I'm not too sure about that. So. Um, so yeah, so that's my family history of endometriosis. So it's definitely suspected that I definitely could have it. I definitely had a lot of painful periods prior to trying to conceive and stuff like that. I just always put it on that it was probably because of my PCOS because I got diagnosed with PCOS, polycystic ovary syndrome, um, in my very early 20s. Um, so... I just thought always it was because of the PCOS and so when I went for that surgery I suspected that the reason why I'm having this increased pain and all these issues is because I probably have endometriosis where what stage I had I just didn't know so when I had the surgery they said that I had about a one stage one stage two borderline two so I thought okay they lasered what he lasered what he could find and then I thought I was gonna have pain relief and I did it so I we kept trying to conceive naturally while I waited. My doctor did recommend that I see an RE, a reproductive endocrinologist. And so the doctor that my insurance um, would cover was one um, that was part of a university group. So they're an educational program. So I 
so the waiting list was very long because it's a more their treatments are more affordable compared to private practice and fertility specialist groups so um I had to wait like three months for an appointment so we kept continuing to try to get pregnant and long behold nine months from the date the month that we started trying I got pregnant sadly I miscarried that pregnancy and ended up having a very hard time during that miscarriage and they thought that maybe it could be a topic um, that I had another laparoscopy surgery my pregnancy was not a topic but my doctor did find that my endometriosis within a five month time span did go from a borderline stage two to a full on stage four and everything inside my abdomen looked like a total mess. I had a lot of scar tissue and a lot of lesions. Um, so she wasn't, I had a different doctor, same gynecologist group. Um, she was wonderful. Um, I, I, I will always be grateful for this doctor because during that time she was the only doctor that was actually willing to take action. Um, and help me find why am I having such a hard time miscarrying that pregnancy because um, I had went to the emergency room four times and no one could offer me any help so um, I had to beg to get into the office and she stayed late to see me and end up doing a surgery that night um, on me and then so she did a DNC and everything like as soon as I had the DNC um, I, I like the the complications were they it went away um, so she did tell me that this endometriosis she's never she compared my images from my first surgery to now she's never seen in someone my age get such a severe growth of endometriosis in such a short time frame and so she highly recommended that my best option at this point is to seek care through the specialist at this point on so I um, had a series of blood work. All my blood work was coming back great, um, which was awesome because that means like my piece to OS wasn't so out of like my hormones from piece to OS were so out of control. They were definitely more balanced. Um, I think that once endometriosis started to kick in, um, be more prominent of my issue, the PCOS kind of took a back seat here but what still stayed um consistent for me was the hormonal acne was something i was still suffering with i was having some excess hair growth not an overly a lot um and then my ovaries still look very polycystic so that's something that in the media, if you're wondering how pcos kind of still kept its prominence within within me so um then i had a hysteroscopy done because the doctor did do a like a high advanced ultrasound and found that I have um, two endometriomas in my right ovary and um, which are cysts in, within your ovary that are filled with endometriosis tissue so uh, I think they're also called chocolate cysts in a, I think um, but the way how deep they are and where they are in my ovary um, the doctor felt like it would be more damage um, to remove them than to, to keep them there. So sometimes when you get endometriomas removed from your ovary, you you risk the do you risk the chance of losing your ovary altogether. So we just decided that it's just best to leave them there since they are on the small side and they're not taking over my ovary at this point. Um, I did have two dye tests done uh, prior. Uh, where they inject dye into your uterus and see how if you have any blockages in your fallopian tubes my right side tends to I have some scar tissue um, in that uh, fallopian tube from my endometriosis and whatnot so that causes um, cause some slowness when it comes to the dye flowing through it however it's not fully blocked so um, they kind of left things as that so I um, had a hysteroscopy that led me to have a hysteroscopy to see, okay, what is my anatomy going on inside my uterus? Because at this point, like, what is going on with the miscarriage? So um, I found, they found that I have a small uterine septum and three uterine polyps. And so they scheduled me to have that surgery to remove them. Um, I was still encouraged to keep trying naturally in the meantime. So a month goes by, I get pregnant again and miscarry again, which then postponed my surgery another month. 
so then at that point it was strongly believed that it must be the uterine septum and my polyps that are not allowing my pregnancies to stick that somehow the embryo is implanting in my septum and not getting enough blood flow because a uterine septum is basically your uterus a normal uterus is kind of looks like this you guys right it's kind of like say it's like this little circle your uterine septum is where inside your uterus you have something that kind of makes the inside look like a heart shape it's not a bicornate uterus so it's not heart shaped from the outside it's just heart shaped within the inside so the septum growing down some people have a complete septum which creates two cavities in your in your uterus mine was a kind of slight septum small um, so I didn't have a complete septated uterus um, but it's a fibrous tissue and there's no blood flow in it so if your embryo somehow attaches to your septum or close to a polyp the polyp is going to take more it's probably bigger and going to take more of the nutrients it needs and if it implants to the to the septum it's not going to get enough blood flow to keep growing like it should right so that is what got explained to me that could be the problem um because at this point my hormones look great i have a great egg um reserve um so it wasn't like I, my body wasn't making enough eggs i had plenty of follicles i have like i said pcos so there's tons of little cysts inside there um so they removed my surgery i had my septum surgery and by far it was the easiest surgery that i had um have had it, my lap surgeries took a lot more recovery time just and it just was really difficult um i feel like anything foreign that happens any type of surgery that i have i just feel like my body doesn't do so well with it like you know i've had a knee surgery before and it just had a rough recovery um so with my lap surgeries i had a rough reco rough um recovery so with my uterine septum it was very much more simple um i definitely was sore for a while um things like that but um you know i didn't get cut open you know so it definitely was easier and they septum was super easy to remove you guys and they just they kind of just clip with scissors the fibrous tissue until they kind of get to a point where they think that they got it all and then they clip the the, the uterine pulps they pull them out and then, of course they send it to get tested and it was non-cancerous so that was good and then they let you heal and so the the plan was that i would try um a few months naturally possibly move to iui and then move to ivf but we wanted to do straight ivf because we felt like there wasn't any problem with ray's um, semen analysis so he didn't have any issues there um and obviously my eggs were good so i would just probably need a little bit ovulation assistance and then probably a trigger um if i did do an iui but it's just like the problem wasn't the sperm getting to the egg and that's normally why they do iois so we felt like you know what instead of wasting the money of doing three to six months of iois let's just wait six months save up for our ivf and do ivf you know so we I, I just and i told my doctor like i'm tired i am so emotionally mentally physically exhausted from dealing with endometriosis by trying to do these cycles naturally like i kept telling him i feel like my body's at war with itself if my body's constantly angry and constantly underneath stress how am i going to get pregnant and stay pregnant so i went and saw another re um to get another opinion i feel like you can never have too many opinions when it comes to your your health especially your reproductive health and so that doctor recommended that i go on three to six months of lupron which is the lupron depot shot and so you do those shots and you basically don't have a period for three to six months and it allows your hormones to be like completely shut down um you don't create estrogen anymore so estrogen endometrial estrogen dominance just like pcos is testosterone dominance you have create more male estrogens when you have pcos so at this point the lupron depot shot would stop me from making um estrogen i wouldn't have a period thus 
um, I wouldn't be able to like keep growing endometriosis tissue outside of my uterus. So, and then once my body was calm, I wasn't having any more pain. Then we would move straight into IVF. My cycle would be completely controlled and that, that would probably be my best option to get pregnant. So, um, talking over with Ray, we said, fine. Like, I think at this point he would have done anything just to make me happy just because, um, this was at this point, um, just shy of probably 15 months actually I had this um 15 months I had this appointment so 15 months in total I think we were just both exhausted he was so tired of just seeing me in pain and just suffering like he just felt helpless so we decided we would go ahead and do it so my Lupron depot shot because I was supposed to get my period later that week so I had my appointment I believe on a Tuesday I was suspecting to get my period on a Friday so we ordered the shot to come in and I would come in at to, for my shot to come in and long behold that night I came home from my I had a morning appointment with the RE I don't know what possessed me to go ahead and take a test I was 10 days past ovulation and I decided that I was just gonna had like one of those little internet cheapy tests right so I took the test not with first morning urine and I said what am I doing I'm just wasting a test right and long behold a small like the faintest positive came up and I remember taking a picture and sending it to my you know sister-in-law and I'm like do you see something and she's like I think I do and then we're putting like filters on our phones to kind of see and we're like oh my gosh there's something there and as it like dried and sat longer like mine got darker so I'm like oh my goodness so then I didn't have pregnancy tests at that point so then I ran to Walgreens no yeah Walgreens stocked up on a ton of tests and who know, I can't even tell you how much money I've spent in the course of on ovulation tests and pregnancy tests during these 15 months. I should have probably tracked it because it probably would be really funny to know for sure. Um, lo and behold, I bought a ton of tests and I kept taking them and I, it was just like my pee is like magic. It's turning all these tests like darker and the line gets darker and the digital one's coming up and I'm like, oh my goodness. So then I call, um, they schedule me to get my beta checked and my ACG isn't going doubling like it should and then it's tripling and then so I was like it's following the normal healthy pattern I'm like oh my gosh this is really happening so I go in for my ultrasounds and there's a baby there like Reeves is there and I'm just so like is this happening to me like somebody pinched me I'm gonna wake up and this is all gonna be over with like this is not even funny you know like not only do I go for one ultrasound and see a little heartbeat, then I go for another one a few weeks later. There's still a baby there. My heart is beating fully, like it's forming. And then just time goes on and on. And I'm like, oh my gosh, you guys, like this is happening. Like my, are you, my trying to conceive journey is over with? Like what? Like, no, like this can't be. So that's kind of my story, you know, really in a, um, Sorry, I'm just trying to see my my SD card here. Um, so that's that's it in its nutshell, you guys, of what I all went on. I, like I said, so much happened during that time. Still, there's probably some things that I'm leaving out. But what I really want to talk more about is the emotions that you go through when you are suffering with infertility um, and you and you have been through you know not even just one miscarriage but you know multiple miscarriages it doesn't matter how many you've had they're just they're terrible you guys to go through and I wouldn't wish it on anyone to go through that um, I kind of I, I feel like I don't carry hatred enough in my in my heart to even say to like say I want to wish it on my worst enemy because I don't like saying that I don't like keeping I don't have enemies you know what I mean um I wouldn't want it for anyone I wouldn't want any woman to have to go through it because I know that emotionally physically and mentally what you go through is so heart-wrenching and so I was talking with my sister-in-law because she also suffered with a very lengthy um, infertility struggle herself. Um, you know, I was just like, what, how do I, how do I, where do I start with this video? And so she, you know, said what things come to mind and what she described it as 
was just perfect it was right on the money exactly like I feel like she took what was in my head and then put it into words for me you know so the first thing is loneliness you feel so lonely yet you have family supporting you you may have a few friends or maybe you didn't open up to your friends about your journey um, I probably like in my last video said I have, I have one really good friend that's kind of stayed consistent during this whole time um, who was there for me um, who also suffered with her own struggles with infertility and, and PCOS and stuff um, to get pregnant with her first child, her, her little boy. Um, and so uh, just loneliness, like you're, you have your family there, but yet you feel so, so alone. And yet everyone around you, it seems, is getting pregnant so easily. Um, with my first miscarriage, I feel you know soon found out people were then announcing that they were um expecting so i had a you know a number of people that were due in may and so i was if i were had stayed pregnant i would have been due in may then i got pregnant again and i would have been due in july and then i found out more people were due in july and so then you know you see their pregnancies progress and you're like how like you see their first ultrasound that they post and you're like wow that would you think to yourself and of course you're happy i was never like jealous to the point where like i didn't want it so jealous of that person that i wanted like i i, I didn't like them <laughs> you know because of it or something i was more of just like what am i doing wrong here like what water are they drinking because i want to drink it and i want to bathe in it i want to soak in it <laughs> if that's gonna like give me some good luck here you know um so it just really throws things in perspective to you because now, like, even now, like, I'm pregnant, you know, I'm due in November. And so now these people that were due in May, June, and then July um, with their, with their, you know, they had their babies recently, um, you think to yourself, oh my gosh, like, that could have, that still could have been me, you know, and of course I wouldn't trade, uh, this um experience because i i like have reeves like he has a name I, I feel him move and so i can imagine if if i didn't lose those pregnancies then i wouldn't have him so um it just is weird to think that like may came along and you see these gorgeous little babies pictures getting posted by their parents and you're like wow like you think to yourself like i could be i could be a mom already you know what i mean like that could have like this is so crazy because you you kind of put out of your head once you like that that could have been you until like you see something that kind of triggers that memory you know um i don't i didn't i don't associate it with a bad thing i just it's just kind of like mind-boggling in a way you know um so you feel everybody around you is getting pregnant so easily and maybe it wasn't so easily and they just didn't open up to you about how hard they tried to get pregnant um you know i had some people tell me like they were suffering with endometriosis too and they were going to pursue ivf and then they got pregnant you know so you're just like wow you know it makes you really think that you don't really truly know what somebody's going through until um until unless they share it so you can't just assume things you can't just assume it was easy for them um just because they're pregnant and you're not you know um you have to just assume everyone has their own story and unless someone i have i have had somebody share with me that they came off birth control and two weeks later they were pregnant you know like wow that's awesome you know and a part of you is like uh you know but then another you then another part of you has to sit and think be like you know what like be happy for them be happy that they don't have to struggle on this same journey as you because you know that it's not easy and I wouldn't want this for anyone because I know how hard it is. So I was constantly having to remind myself to not become a bitter person during this process. And when you're hurting so bad and all different levels, um, it is really easy to start feeling bitter and hating the world. Like I was feeling bitter not towards other people but i was bitter about myself i was bitter how i felt um i was just i, I was just hating everything i was miserable i didn't want to do anything i didn't want to leave the house i felt like myself just really wanting to just sleep lay on the couch 
um, I really felt like I, I would need some medica some depression medication because I didn't feel like me anymore. Felt like something was off in my head. Um, there's some times where I didn't know if I wanted to live anymore because I felt like my only purpose in this life was just to suffer in pain and to always want a baby because I've been wanting a baby and starting a family. I've just been wanting a family and to for so long. Um, that I felt like I've just had so much trouble that, that that's just my life. Um, and meanwhile, I'm watching all these people get pregnant and have families and see happiness. And it is, you want that too. You want to share a piece of that. You want a piece of that for yourself. Um, so that was hard. That was, I've never had thoughts where like, I thought like, is it even worth living anymore? So that was scary for me to have that. And then I kept telling like my family, like a few of my family members, um, that I, I think I need, and, and telling Ray, like, I think it's time for me to go see the doctor. I think I need, I think I need help. That my thoughts are no longer on are healthy. Um, and so, you know, everyone was supportive, but I just kept trying to push forward and push forward and then I tried I got involved in working out um, Ray for Christmas bought um, I asked for personal training because I felt like if I just did something kind of more positive for myself that it would kind of help me break away and that personal training did help me a lot because I was focusing on something other than getting pregnant so I was working out with a really great trainer and um, you know really just her encouragement during this time and her help during this time just helped me feel good about myself. I was seeing progress in my body and how my body was getting toned and I was just feeling fit and I was feeling good. So I felt like that really helped me get past um, the depression. I still had some ups and down days, but I started my training in January and I feel like that's when I started kind of coming coming up out of, out of my, my depression. Um, I have days where I had days still that I was just like didn't want to do anything just felt really just lazy um and but like I said it just it slowly got better and better and better and um and of course any of you who who are having you know um you know depression and you're having just odd thoughts like like I mentioned to you like you, you just don't want to live or you you think about even hurting yourself like please like don't hesitate to get help uh, from a doctor, you know, if you need some medication, it's not the end of the world. I think some people look down upon that, but um, I, I, I truly feel, and I've heard, you know, a family member say who has suffered with depression that um, it's the worst feeling ever, that she has no problem taking something every single day for her depression because she feels like a, a herself again. And that's the most important. I think people think, oh, there's something wrong with you if you have to take like an anxiety medication or a depression medication and you know I'm all for doing things in the all natural way but sometimes you know we have these medications there for a reason and I feel like there's no point to having those type of thoughts and living like that um, so if I weren't seeing myself get um, you know increasingly better um, you know, from doing some exercising and stuff like that, I would have had no problem getting some um, some help from a doctor with, you know, by medication. So please don't allow yourself to get to a point where you may, you may hurt yourself. Um, I know that this journey can be very grueling on you. And eventually, like at first, I didn't think that I would wear. I mean, everyone keeps telling me, oh, you're so strong. I wish I could be like you. And meanwhile, like I am sitting here and I'm like, what? Like, I don't want to live anymore. Like, do they? I don't even know how to admit that. I'm upset at myself for admitting that, that I don't want this life anymore because this life is nothing but pain. I keep losing babies, and then I keep ha getting told by people, even my family members, that you know, put it in your head that you're no longer like you don't suffer from the pain that you're not in pain anymore and then your pain won't be there like kind of mind over matter thing and I'm like thinking to myself that doesn't make sense my pain is real why you know I've had people I've overheard conversations like she's doing it for attention 
And I'm like, why would I do this for attention? Why would I want to suffer in pain like this just for attention? Like, I don't need attention that bad. I, I haven't lived this... I wasn't raised where I had parents that never paid attention to me. Like, I had very loving parents. My mom was, like, a good mom. Like, you know, like, I was loved. I've always felt loved. I always felt cherished by, you know, my, my family. Um, so I, I wasn't like I was needing this for attention for any reason. Um, it was very real. So it was very hurtful to hear these things um, from people. I... Um, you know, kept feeling like, if you tell me to put it out of my head, I won't feel this pain. This is very real. I have to deal with this. I can't just pretend it's not happening to me because I tried that. I tried that, that, it, you know, just all oh, going very well. This is just, this is just one time I'm going to have a bad period. But then months and months of bad periods come by and then your miscarriages happen and you lose these babies and then people try to tell you helpful things and they're not very helpful. You get told, um, you that God, you know, it wasn't God's timing. So that's why you had your miscarriages. Why would God give me these babies in the first place if it wasn't his timing? If it was his timing, I would have never gotten pregnant, right? Like that that's how it works, right? Like it, it, that doesn't make sense to me. Or there was, wouldn't you rather it happen now instead of later? Like your baby be born with something like terrible, like Down syndrome, I'm like Down syndrome is not that terrible. It's like not ideal, like I wouldn't want that for my child, but I would still love my child. I know that my child, people with Down syndrome these days are able to live normal lives, you know, like they're living longer and there's just, there's so much help and treatment like for, for people with Down syndrome. So I, I never, I didn't think of that as like life or like a life or death thing. Um, I get it if like my baby was born without a brain, like, yeah, that's horrible. Like, you know, um. But so I, I didn't feel like that was that was never comforting to me. Like why 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 God is giving me these babies and then I'm losing them. He's taking them away from me. Meanwhile, there's teenagers getting pregnant. Children are getting pregnant and having children. You know what I mean? Like what is this? Like am I not a good enough person to have children? Um why do I have this desire to be a mom so bad if I'm never going to have children of my own? You know, um I am all for adoption. I think it's a wonderful thing. I definitely tried to pursue it and I would pursue it in the future if it's something that gets put on Ray's heart too. Um, but for me, as I knew that I would never forgive myself if I did not put my whole heart into trying to get pregnant. Um, and so I'm so happy that I started trying when I did even though I'm young. I'm not where I want to be when it comes to my career and education and I'm not married yet. So things that are kind of like the stat, like you, society says, oh, you have to wait until all those things are done. You're done with those things to have a baby. Um, I'm so glad that I did every, did that opposite because the struggle that I had, if I waited that long, I don't know if I, how, what this struggle would have been like if I was older. Um, and I'm so happy that I have had the opportunity and I did meet somebody that is right for me and um, that our relationship is solid and good and um, and that is in the position to be able to welcome a child into the world. So um, those things I just never felt were helpful or comforting to me or, you know... Um, you, you find out during these times who your true friends are. Um, you'll have those friends that will text you once in a while. They'll ask you how you are and you'll try to explain to them how, like, what you're feeling. And they either don't text you back once you do that or they just say, I'm sorry. Um, and maybe they don't know what to say because they probably know that there's not too much that they can say to comfort you. But sometimes when it comes to things like that, just pick up the phone and call that person. Because sometimes just hearing that a voice on the other line, just, it just it's more personable um, than just a text message. You know, your friend lost the baby. Your friend's struggling really hard. Do you, do you try, try to understand that? You know, try to get on their level or that family member. Your family member, your family is struggling really bad. 
don't just send a text message. It's so impersonal, personable. Pick up the phone and really call that person because you never know what they're going through. You never know what they're experiencing, like the emotions that they're going through. And hearing your voice on the other line may just be that something just to, to keep them pushing forward just a little bit longer. You know, that might give them that motivation. You know what? I can do this. I can do this. I can keep fighting at this. Um, and my other suggestion to you guys who are struggling and people ask you how you're doing, just be honest. Just, just don't say, oh, okay, or good. I'm doing good. You know, don't just be honest with them. You'd be like, no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm having a hard time, but I'm trying to push through it. You know, like just be honest with what you're feeling because if you just go on and telling everything's good and dandy and fine, but really it's not, then you might not get that support that you truly need. Um, I've tried to be a lot more open in what I'm going through and some of my friends haven't been so great about being supportive. It's either some of my family, but at the same time, I know that they love me and they're there for me when I need them. You know, if I called up my mother and be like, mom, I really don't, I, I really need you to come. I'm not doing so well mentally and emotionally right now. I really need you. Like she would be hopping in the car and she'd be here. So, um, I thank you guys so much for allowing me to share this video with you. I hope that there's some parts of it that you can relate to. If there's something that I did not cover that you want me to go more in detail with, please leave a comment or message me on, on either Facebook or Instagram. I'd be happy to do so. Um, Again, I'm praying for you guys. I'm rooting for you guys in your journeys. Um, sorry, I'm gonna get emotional again. Don't give up. Um, don't lose hope because there's always hope. Even when you feel like there's none, there's always some small amount there. Just focus on that. And um, know that, at the, that there is going to be an end to your journey and you, God, will bless you with a baby. And you don't know how he's going to bless you with that baby, but you will be a parent. Just keep fighting. Thank you guys. I love you all. And I will see you guys next week for my next video. Bye now.